And we're live. Welcome to the masterclass by the Meister Musicians Academy in Lexington. My name is Daniel Braniatowski, and our website is www.maestromusicianslexington.com. We are a music school based in Lexington, Massachusetts, not Lexington, Kentucky, that is uh, just outside of Boston. And uh, in addition to serving Greater Boston with quality music lessons for all ages and stages, we now come to you anywhere in the world via Facebook Live. It is a new and exciting world for music studios and schools everywhere. And I hope you will bear with us as we investigate and explore and learn about this new technology. Tonight's class is called Anyone Can Learn Piano. Our special guest is named Nippon Malhotra, and we will be talking about all things piano tonight, including a little peek at how lessons work with one of his students, who we will introduce shortly. Pianist Nippon Malhotra was born in 1993 in India, having grown up in Delhi, a place uh, primarily detached from Western classical music, he spent his early years playing Hindustani classical music on the harmonium. And it wasn't, however, until he gained exposure to the art form of piano playing in his mid-teenage years that he really noticed a significant affinity to the classical musical genre. Malhotra started playing piano or learning piano at the age of 16, and uh, he continued his lessons during his high school and college year years. By the time he had obtained a bachelor's degree in mathematics, uh, Nippon's love for music had just grown too much for it to remain a hobby, and he decided to shift his focus to pursuing music full time. I love those kinds of stories. Nippon has since performed extensively in his hometown of Delhi, both as an accompanist and a soloist, and he was selected to play in several master classes with many eminent pianists. Malhotra won top prizes in two of the most important national uh, piano competitions in India, uh, Conrio and MusicWest. And in 2018, he obtained a master of music degree in piano performance from the Longy School of Music of Bard College, where he studied with the renowned American pianist, Spencer Meyer. As a teacher, Nippon puts a heavy emphasis on helping his students um, build a strong basis they, make a, they build an efficient playing technique while tying it into elements of sound production necessary, theory that goes with it, and ear training. This ensures that all aspects of piano playing are developed simultaneously. Nippon teaches students of all levels, ranging from early beginners and all ages to advanced, while, while he still mainly specializes in teaching the classical repertoire, he does enjoy and is experienced with teaching music from all genres. Having taken up piano relatively late himself, Nippon strongly believes that with a healthy amount of dedication and willingness to invest time and patience, anyone can attain a high level of proficiency at, in this art form, regardless of what age they start. So uh, Nippon, I've uh, given everyone a uh, bio about you. Uh, why don't you just uh, say a little hello and it's really great to have you on board tonight. Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks, Daniel, for introducing me. Um, I mean, it's been great. Uh, my I started working at Maestro Musicians about a year back now, and um, it's 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 really because because I never um, learned at that age learned piano at that age. It's it's very interesting to see how dedicated and uh, invested students can get at that age, and um, to see the students um, develop this kind of work ethic and discipline um, at an age where most students kind of you know just just uh, spend their time playing you know, and, and which, which is also important but but to see these qualities getting instilled into them at ages that young it's it's very interesting and very inspiring even for me absolutely i i absolutely think it's a wonderful thing that you know one of the one of the things that many people who start piano lessons um know but many people who are not initiated in the piano world is that often piano is the first instrument so for so many students and so many children, you know, start as young as four years old. And because of that, um, you know, it really gives them a strong foundation in music and it gives them so many uh, wonderful uh, worlds to explore from a, a um, sonoric standpoint, from a Absolutely. tonal standpoint as well. Yeah. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about um, you know, your experiences in India because it's not something that many of us in uh, this audience know much about and it's very intriguing and I'd like to know a little bit more about actually the harmonium if you don't mind telling us yeah and also sure. what's the classical music scene like in India 
Um, well, classical music scene in India is much more um, inclined towards the Indian classical music. It's the, the Western classical music is rather, I would say it's, it's even rarely known, I would say, because the, the, the main thing is India, the, the people in India, and especially the people who promote art and culture in India, they, they have um, everyone in that community uh, values Indian classical music much more at this point. And they, they try to promote the Indian tradition and the Indian heritage uh, over the Western traditions as of now, which is why the, in, the Western classical music is kind of uh, very, very subdued as of now. Um, the interesting thing is uh, because of internet, thanks to internet, um, people have gotten to know about it and it's kind of gaining popularity, even though not among the people who promote it, but among students of students who are teenagers and students who are very young because they, they see pianists um, through YouTube and through all these social media sites. Um, and they, they feel like it's it's a very um, exciting instrument and they, they wish to learn it. And because of that reason, it's sort of getting traction now. And people have, while it's not really at a very high level in my country, it's it's still gaining popularity. And, and I think, I believe that in the next few decades, it would be at a pretty, pretty surprisingly great level. Yeah, and as of harmonium, harmonium is a very different instrument from piano. A piano is, you know, piano is the kind of instrument, and this is actually the main reason why I shifted to it. Um, piano has this quality of making you, giving you an option to speak through it. And that's, that's something that's not very common among many instruments. Um, like piano is the kind of instruments you know, I mean, you know that piano is basically at the center of a lot of instruments. And it's, it's the kind of instruments that can replicate orchestras. It, it's, it can replicate different instruments. It can replicate voice. And because of that reason, there's this personality that you can instill in your playing, which is no one else's and just your own. And that quality of, um, that, that potential that this instrument had of, um, being my voice is what basically attracted me um, so much, which which is not something the harmonium has. I love that. And, you know, I think that one of the common underlying themes about all of uh, musicians, uh, all of us musicians, is that we have this internal desire to just express ourselves and to um, really uh, speak a language which goes so much mm -hmm. more deep than words and of course uh, maybe vocalists will disagree with me on that <laughs> but at the same time you know you don't even need words to to describe the deepest emotions and feelings Absolutely. and um you know that's one of the really uh, amazing things about about this language and i believe that as it applies to um children you know you can teach children about so many things about life that uh i believe would be sorely missing from their experience um, if they did not have music lessons, and although this sounds mm -hmm. like a, in some ways a shameless plug for music, um, it's really you know what we believe that we believe that there is a necessity to um, to have people have a certain kind of emotional and also um, uh, psychological uh, experience, which will make them a more well-rounded person and individual. Um, so you know what I'd like to do is since we're on this topic, um, and we did talk about the fact that. Uh, many people start playing piano even as young as four years old. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, young children and, and how they can benefit from these lessons. Because, um, you know, I'm sure that uh, you and I will see eye to eye on many things. But from your experience as a piano teacher, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, the youngest kids you've taught and what it is that really um, you think made a difference in their lives. Well... I think one, one of the biggest things that people need to realize, and I mean, kids can't realize that because they're very young to do so, is that after a certain age, you start to regret the things that you didn't do previously in your life that you had a chance to do. And um, piano is the kind of instrument that, I mean, actually any instrument, but uh, there are a lot of people who find that they, they have an affinity to this instrument. So 
there are a lot of people who basically say, I, I wish I had never quit and I, I wish I had never stopped playing at that age. And the reason that happens is because, you know, after a certain age, the amount of work that's required to gain a certain level of proficiency is actually much more than it would be than that um, of the amount of work that you, that would be required when you would when you were like very young. So, for example, um, if you were if you are four years old and you were you are working, you know, to, to you are practicing say fifteen minutes every day, that actually is much more um, productive and that that gives you much more results than practicing the same amount of time at age 25 would do. And um, the reason for that primarily is that kids just are carefree. And this carefree attitude basically prevents any hindrances in their learning processes. As adults, we, we you know, having gone through so many life experiences, we learn to basically criticize ourselves um, a lot and, and we, we beat ourselves up and we tell ourselves, oh no, this is not how it was supposed to be. And no, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not doing well enough and people, other people are much more talented than me, but kids don't think that way. And um, the, the benefits, the benefit um, to learning at, at a young age actually lies in this very fact that at that age, you are just less hard on yourself. And by the time you grow up by the time, say, you are a teenager, you start to really value um, and start to care about something that you learned while you were very carefree about it. And it's, it's this process of, um, you know, gaining something um, while not caring too much about it, but then valuing it later in your life that I think most people miss because of having not attempted learning or just stop learning piano at a young age. So it's, it's in my opinion, a very, very important part of um, someone's development to, to actually employ any art form in, in their lives. Um, music is just one of them, but this is the things I'm saying are actually common with all art forms. Yeah. I 100% agree with you. And I think this is, uh, you know, an answer that, uh, um, frankly, um, really blew us all away. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, it's so, so true what you say about, you know, it's, it's more than just children, you know, eating their vegetables, so they get strong in life. These are life skills that, that we're teaching, which um, really go uh, very much in the vein of communication, and learning about common culture and history and common human emotions and uh, ability to interact with other people and empathize and sympathize. And all of that really happens through the what I call a magic medium of sound. Um, mm -hmm. So without further ado, I mean, I think like, you know, a lot of people are now interested to uh, hear our guest and, and uh, learn about your students. So what I'm going to do is we're going to, just going to check that he can hear us still and we can hear him. Um, now, I'd like to very uh, quickly just test that out. His name is Oscar and Oscar is a student of Nippon's. Oscar, do you hear us okay? Yes. Wonderful. Oscar, welcome to our program. Oscar is here with his mother. And uh, Oscar, tell us how old are you? Seven. You're seven years old. All right, wonderful. And um, what do you like the most about piano? Mm, I just like to play the songs mostly and have fun exploring. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's um, that's what it's all about, and that's what uh, makes us even the, what makes the professionals even want to keep going every day. And you know, every day is a new adventure in music, and every day you learn new things about it, and never stop learning, never stop doing that. Um, how long have you been playing, Oscar? Um, how long have you been playing? Yeah. Just about yeah. a year, I think. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right since uh, when I got to know your family. Um, so I'll tell you what, uh, Nippon, can you tell us what Oscar's going to be playing? And then I'll let you guys take it away. Yeah, so so I've been making Oscar go to um, a very good method book, which which is it mainly comprises of pieces which are at a progressive level of difficulty. It's called the Russian Piano School. Um, so this is one of the pieces that focuses uh, a lot on melodic projection of sound. And um, it's, it's a very interesting thing um, because piano is thought of as a percussion instrument in many ways, while it does have melodic aspects. 
but um, sometime in the history, it changed to being uh, an instrument that could be in sync. Um, and this is the kind of piece that basically makes that transition in, in this pedagogical phase where um, initially, we were, initially we were doing pieces which were more um, percussion based, you know, uh, just very discrete kind of playing, but this is the kind of piece which has more legato elements to it, more melodic lines. And uh, this is what we are focusing on. It's called Birds and it's, it's a very short piece like eight bars um, and it has an accompaniment. So uh, I, I believe uh, Oscar's mom will be playing with him. So, so it'll be, it'll be fun, yeah. All right, Oscar, whenever you're ready, we'd love to hear you. Job, Oscar. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's taken a great shape. I mean, since the last time you played it for me, um, one very important thing in this piece, and which which I was just talking about, um, we will discuss dynamics as well. But but for now, the the main thing that I want to discuss is legato. So so when you are playing these, uh, say the first, look at the second bar. So you have one two one two, right? Um, I, I do know that these are same repeating notes, but it's very important for you to not make it sound like it's just buttons. Um, I mean, you're not you're not playing like that. You're, you're playing it pretty well, but um, in in any music that's you know melodic, you have to make sure that the music the, the notes sound much more connected. So. So if you can make sure that the notes, each of the notes don't sound like. So when you're playing it like that, it's more like one, two, three, four. And that's happening primarily because you're thinking of each note separately. If you can think of the whole first two bars as one bar and just play it in one go. So don't think about each note. You, you have the music memorized well enough for you to not be able to for you to not need to think about each note. So just go. So don't think about each, each separate note. Just, just think about the whole line. Just think about the two bars and just play, play once, play once slowly and try with your eyes closed. Um, you don't have to accompany him, Fumiko. You, you don't have to accompany him. Yeah, just play it alone, yeah. was much better yes especially the first bar that was great can you can you play the second bar for me once just the four notes um can you can you try making sure that each note is a little longer so instead of if you can make sure it's like make sure each note is a little longer play it to its full length That's good. Can you play it in, in the in the tempo, in the actual speed of the piece? Just the first two bars. Much better, much better. Once more. Yeah, that's good. And again, don't 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 be too hard upon yourself. Um, regarding making sure that there's a diminuendo. I, I know you are, you are, you want that to happen, but the most important mm -hmm. thing, if you want to care about crescendos and diminuendos, is to actually start soft at the beginning of crescendo and to end soft at the at the end of a diminuendo. So it's the so the first note of your first bar, that should be soft. Don't start it with a uh, 
Uh, so don't start it with uh, this. So don't do that because when you accent the first note, then you can't do a crescendo. So start the first note soft. Much better. Can you do the uh, third and fourth bars? Yeah, and same thing in the in the fourth bar. Make sure each note is a little longer, and the last note should be soft. Much better. Yes, can you play the first four bars now? And and try this time. This time, try a little faster. So, just for the just just to make you think, um, Oscar. Just to make you think faster, try try to play the first four bars at this tempo. So try playing at that tempo. Good. Uh, and always make sure that your right hand is ready. So don't keep your right hand down here. When you are playing with the left hand, because if you're doing, you're too late. So make sure your hands are both hands are always on the keyboard, even if you are playing just with one hand. So, right hand ready. Okay, try that. Uh, can can we begin, Oscar? Can we begin? The first note should be soft. Can we begin soft? Excellent. Okay. Next four bars, please. Yeah, uh, again, just just make sure that the last note is soft. Don't worry about every note being softer than the one before. Yeah, uh, just play me the last two bars once. Um, in rhythm, uh, so make sure your rhythm is strict. So don't, don't, don't do that. Yeah, it's getting slower. So just one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Yeah, once more, please. Okay, make sure make sure you have a, a constant tempo going. So if if you if you slow down, then the piece loses its momentum. It's it's kind of like um, you know how how have, do you like any sports? Like do you watch any games? Do you like do you like playing any games? Yeah. Do you like have you seen people play soccer, for example? Have you seen people run? Yeah, right. In soccer, if if everyone just suddenly slows down in the game, then the game gets boring. It's always exciting when people are maintaining how fast they are running, right? If every everyone just suddenly gets tired and everyone is suddenly running slowly, then it's not as interesting. It's kind of the same. You have to maintain the momentum of the piece. So if you can keep the piece going at the same tempo, Excellent. That's it. That's it. Can we play the whole thing again? And just you alone at this tempo, please. Begin soft and end soft. Good, very good. Can, can you can you uh, play with your mom once?
So, so much better. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Uh, just one more thing that I want you to experiment with in general. Um, whenever you feel like something that you are thinking too much about individual notes, um, which, which was happening in the beginning, which didn't happen this time, um, close your eyes and play the section once more. So if you can try playing, um, I mean, I'm sure it's memorized by now, right? The piece is memorized. Right, Oscar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can you play me, uh, so the first four bars with your eyes just completely shut. Good, good, that's great, yes. Uh, a little faster, please. Yes, I mean, I don't know if you noticed, but the notes sound so much more connected. It's because you stopped, stopped worrying about each note. And once you start doing that, when we close our eyes, we are thinking more about the bigger picture. And, and that, that helps you create more flow in music. Um, similarly, if you can play me the last four bars the same way with your eyes closed. Yes, uh, once more, just once more and with the tempo constant, like you were doing before. Excellent. Yes, yes, that's great. Yeah, great job. Yes, I mean, uh, this, this, he, he, he has, I mean, he's, he's one of my more talented students and um, I've sometimes, I, and I mean, it might sound weird, but, but there are things that I figure out while teaching him. Um, like when I'm having trouble with my practicing, my own practicing, and when I go to teach him and some of my other students as well, there are things that I'm teaching them and I'm like, oh, wait, wait a second. I could do that in my own practicing. And so it's not just a learning experience for him, but also for my own. Um, and, and not only do I teach him, he, he inspires me in turn as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that, that kind of concludes uh, what we had to work on. A short one, but, but a productive lesson. Oscar, thank you so much for joining us this evening and for sharing your music with us. Um, I, I really could see the evolution from the beginning of when you started this piece to, you know, um, your endeavors with Nippon to make it more legato, which means smoothly and more flowing. And I know this is um, something that takes a long time to develop as a, you know, for a pianist. Um, I see it in my own son's playing, who is about your age as well. And uh, ironically, I, I, you surprised me because I didn't know that you were going to be using the same book he's using. <laughs> so this is oh, very wow. familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, it was music to my ears, but um, so, <laughs> but I did want to um, say, uh, Oscar, thank you so much for joining us on this program. And um, anything you want to uh, to just conclude with, Oscar? No, nothing you wanted to say about your musical experiences or something that you you know particularly enjoy in in music or what you like about music. No, I won't put you on the spot. <laughs> right. I, I, was, I can understand um, kids being Mike Fright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, but Oscar, thank you. And um, we will uh, see you. We'll see you around, I'm sure. Um, yes. Nippon, um, before we conclude, I want to also um, thank you for being on our program as well. Um, and, uh, you know, before we, uh, you know, just uh, call it an evening, uh, Nippon, let's talk a little bit actually just about technique in general, because, you know, one of the uh -huh. things that I think is so impressive and so um, uh, wonderful about the idea about, you know, making a new piece of music really speak to an audience or even to oneself when one is playing is that, you know, one of the things that we saw in your teaching in, of this piece is that even with just a piece that's gosh, is it what, eight bars long or something? It's a very short piece. There's so mm -hmm. much detail and so much we can, um, we can glean from learning how to make that piece just, you know, really sound at its best. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, the thing about piano is, 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's about even other instruments, but I, I only specialize in this one, so I can only speak for piano. So there is, there are very few elements actually, and countable elements in um, the piano technique, which need to actually be defined. It's not an infinite number of elements. The thing is, you can only define it by going through an infinite amount of repertoire. And those very few elements, when focused on separately and exclusively, uh, basically just you know making sure that your practice is productive and you basically know what you are dribbling at. Um, if, you, if you are just working on making sure that, okay, um, while I'm playing right now, I have to make sure that my, my sound is projecting, that my voices are layered, which, which comes way, which is a much more advanced concept in piano playing because it, it's kind of like a painting. So in a painting, there's this thing about perspective, right? So some things are supposed to appear closer to you and some things are supposed to appear further, further back. In the same way in piano playing, some voices are much more important and some me melodic lines are supposed to speak much more and they're supposed to be much more projected than the other ones which are supposed to stay in the background. So these kinds of things, if you basically are, if, you, if your mind is running the music in its head, if, I mean, if your mind is running the music in a way that's um, already pre-layered, then what you, then the music that you play is, is going, the, then what you are basically practicing will be much more productive because um, you'll be practicing while making sure that you are creating those layers. If you just practice blindly, then that layering aspect will be ignored. Um, similarly for other aspects of technique, and when I say technique, I mean musical elements and as well as um, you know, physical elements. Um, for stuff like just general, the physical mm -hmm. posture and, and you know, just the general virtuosity. Um, there are a few elements. One is how hand flexibility, you know, we, we all are blessed with different sizes, but you'd be so hand sizes, but you'd be surprised to see how people with very small hand sizes can play way better than people with much larger hands. And uh, that's mainly because they have basically learned to, you know, just jump around the keyboard in the most economic ways. And which is one of the most important principles in technique, uh, economy. You know, you have to work as less as possible to accomplish to accomplish as much as possible. And um, for that, there are just these things about making sure that you are not wasting any more movements, um, that uh, while, when you are moving your hand to the left, you don't just let the momentum take over and just throw it to the left. You know, you have to think about larger lines and you have to make sure that as you're moving to the left and if the next three notes start to the right, then your hand, hand moves in such a motion that it basically keeps it takes into account what's coming. It's kind of called, it's like foresight, you know, just, just the hand knowing what's going to come. And it's, it's a very complicated thing, but all in all, if you just um, try to reduce it, it really comes down to like say 10 or 11 elements. And it's, it's a lifelong process, but it very, when, when one focuses on them, exclusively, it's, it's possible to achieve um, a good amount of expertise fairly quickly, actually. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I absolutely uh, can agree with that and have experienced that, you know, particularly one of the things that really um, kind of struck a chord with me, no pun intended, <laughs> was the, the fact that you're talking about different body shapes and sizes and how that relates to the uh, music that we produce. You know, a lot of people who are not as uh, familiar with classical music or maybe even those who are familiar don't uh, realize that when two different people are playing the exact same piece not only can the interpretation be different but even if they played the same piece with an attempt to play the same way it would still sound different if you exactly. listen really carefully sometimes you don't have to listen carefully and you notice and the reason for that you know as you mentioned is because of the anatomical changes and i'll give you a, a great example just from my experience which mm -hmm. um people can emulate if they're singers as well. I'm not a singer, but I'm a violinist. And 
string players like singers have the ability to do vibrato, which, uh, you know, when your voice goes, uh, <laughs> so I'm not, uh, all the singers, if there are any singers watching, they're probably saying, what did he just do? But anyway, <laughs> what I'm uh, getting at is the fact that um, just by the virtue of the fact that my hand shape is different than the other guy who's playing violin next to me, or the other gal who's playing violin next to me, you know, um, in an orchestra, for instance, even, and we're playing the same thing. Well, if someone's got a very long and bony hand structure compared to those who are maybe shorter and uh, dare I say chubbier, <laughs> they're going to have a different sound that comes out. And as a result of that, um, you will notice the difference. And in some ways, I think that's what, in many ways, that's what contributes um, in addition to artistic interpretation that also contributes to why some people gravitate toward liking some artists singing or playing uh, more than others. And what um, I and I'm sure you uh, very much have, have realized in your uh, artistic career is that as you have become more advanced um, as a performer and advanced in age, and I don't mean you're old, <laughs> but more uh, experienced, I should say, what happens is that we, we realize that it's time for us to find our own unique language and our own way of playing based on what we have been given <laughs> and yeah. we all know our own limitations we know what we're capable of what we're not capable of and sometimes we figure this out over time it, it, you know going full circle it's back to the fact that music is a lifelong process and mm -hmm. there are always peaks and valleys in in the learning process um, and so many different things we can gain from that Absolutely. Anyway, we yeah. are uh, approaching the end of our program, so I did want to conclude it up and tie a nice ribbon on it. So <laughs> thank you for joining us this evening. It's yeah, been my a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's our pleasure. And it's um, always great to um, speak with you, even if we're all confined right now into uh, our, uh, our quarters. Um, <laughs> I really hope, along with everyone else, this is not going to last too long. But you know, I hope thank so, you. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I do hope that um, you, our listeners, will also join us over the next two days where we will present another two master classes. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we've been trying to also garner is a little bit of uh, interaction with the audience. So if anyone wants in the future classes to ask any questions that we can answer live, we'd love to do that. You can PM us. Uh, you can send me a question even um, by email tonight or tomorrow before our next uh, masterclass and we'll be happy to answer them. The, the way to do that, you can either uh, private message us on the Maestro Musicians Lexington Facebook page, or you can email us at lessons at maestromusicians.com. Uh, again, our website is www.maestromusicianslexington.com, just uh, because we had to be a little more confusing. It's maestromusicianslexington.com. <laughs> and um, just to give you the heads up on what's coming up, Tomorrow on Thursday, we're doing a violin class called Teaching Beauty with Violin by uh, Judy Yu, who is uh, one of our instructors. And that class, in addition to this one, well, it's scheduled for 7.30, but of course, um, you know, we're, we're new at this, so we, we've been starting a bit late. Uh, so it's between 7.30 and 7.45. And on Friday, we're going to have a guitar class with Steve uh, Latinitian called Learn Guitar with Steve, and that is going to be a 3.30 p.m. class. Uh, it's a little bit of a different time than the last few days. We we're just trying something new for that day. And uh, we might even have another class early next week, but we're, we're still, uh, in, that's in the works. And uh, this is uh, a grand experiment and uh, we'd love to hear your feedback, uh, you, our listeners and viewers. So uh, please check in with us again on our Facebook page. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, please. And share it with your friends as well. Uh, again, this is Daniel Boroniotowski from the Maestro Musicians Academy. MaestroMusiciansLexington.com, and we're signing off till next time. So long, everyone. Be well and take good care of yourselves.